First things first, we are going to talk about debt a little bit more, but a lot of you already know that after college you'll earn more money in a job. That's a good reason to go to college, right, if you have a degree. So let's look at how much more money you'll earn if you have a degree. Thirteen hundred a week more, which is four to five thousand dollars a month. If you have a high school diploma, you'll earn eight hundred and nine dollars extra per week with no degree, which means basically you get an extra two thousand dollars a month for having a bachelor's degree on average. You know, if you're really excited and you're motivated to go in and get your degree, and then you get it, and you're like, okay, where's my money? That's not exactly how it works. And one of the biggest impacts of how much money you earn relates to what your college major was. So one thing we're going to talk about is once you get out of college and start your job search, you're ready to go into the field, many times we do have a harder time because they'll see, oh, you're deaf, you can't do this job. Or, oh, you know, we're super excited, we're invested in you. And then they realize, oh, communication, it's not going to work, it's too much. That does happen. So when you pick a major that makes you a high in-demand person, companies are more willing to work with you because they need your skills. So these are the best college paid majors, excuse me, best majors that you can get to get paid well. They are all engineering, science, technology, they're all STEM. These are the top 10, but there are other majors that pay very well that are not engineering. For example, many business majors in different business fields, management, those do pay pretty well, but this is just the top 10. I'm curious, what do you think the worst paying college majors are? Let's look. You know, it seems as though it's half of the income of an engineer. And I want to emphasize here psychology. $37,000 a year. Why did I mention this? It's because it's really important that people who like psychology, it's an incredibly popular college major. A lot of people picked a major in psychology. And if you really love it, you are a psychologist at heart, pick it. You know, I don't want you to pick a major just because you aren't sure about how much money it's going to make. Your passion is what's most important. If you hate engineering and you show up to an engineering job every day, you're probably going to be fired because you don't like it. It's important to have a job that you like and then maybe find more ways to earn money. This is the OOH. You don't have to read the whole thing. But it is the Occupational Outlook Handbook. And what you can do is you can search for a specific job, a specific major, a specific field, and figure out how much it pays. Is it in the top 10, is it in the bottom 10, or is it somewhere in the middle? I do have slides that I'll pass out later, and I can also email them to you, where there's a lot of my personal comments in the slides. I have links, I have information. So some of this will be there, so you don't have to memorize the website, but it'll be Also, I wanted to mention, so you get into college, you're so excited, you're going to get your money, you pick an engineering major, and you go in, you know, it's, it's not super expensive, you're ready, give me your money. And the first thing I want to re-emphasize is that for us deaf and hard of hearing students, college is tough. It was designed for very able, hearing, white, privileged environment. And it feels as though we're still stuck in 1800s Germany sometimes. You know, I do want to get into that, but I'll hold it for a moment. So when you go into college, your mentality might be, okay, I'm going to find the perfect formula, I'm going to plug it in, now I have an accessible college experience. Sure, thank you. It's not about what fits you, it's about what fits the system. So when you go in or struggle or fail a class, it's not your fault, it's not your intelligence. You are coming from behind, so don't feel bad. Okay, 
Okay, so pretend you didn't see that slide because we'll come back to it. So the national average, how many people do you think enter college for a four-year degree and then drop out? What do you think? Shut Throw me some answers. What do you think? 50%? Oh, yeah, you're exactly right. 50% of people enter college and then drop out. Now, for deaf and hard of hearing people, guess the percentage. Someone says high percentage. Let me show you. Yep, that's seven out of ten deaf and hard of hearing people drop out of college. And I was one of those seven. I'll tell you a little bit of my story here. So I planned to graduate from CU. I came into this college. I remember the day CU sent me my expulsion letter. I saw it and I realized I don't know how to do college. I tried so many different ways and obviously I still failed. Maybe I'm just not good at college. But in the real world, I started working, I started picking up skills and I realized I can do college, so I came back. That I, excuse me, that I needed college, so I came back. This is a big change, and it's hard. Some tricks that I did pick up to succeed, I will share with you today. You know, I didn't show up to speak and then want to show off all my credentials, but there are different ways of thinking. And typically the advice you get is to go to college and just do it. And that advice is literally, excuse me, generally for people who already have the benefits, the privileges of accessibility into the educational system. Before we jump into college, I want to discuss about how to succeed in college, but first, I know some people are thinking about how expensive college is, and maybe you think that means it's not for you. So I want to have this discussion first. First, we can talk about money, because you have many options. DVR is definitely an option, so first you apply to DVR, and they will pay for your whole college experience. But you do have to apply very early, because there's a significant waiting. In my opinion, this is one of the best options for deaf and hard of hearing people. Community colleges are much cheaper than four-year universities. You can take some courses, transfer them over to a four-year university, and half of your university experience is done. So that's a much cheaper option. This is not about getting the highest GPA necessarily, but it's about going in and picking some easy courses, taking fewer courses. You know, maybe you'll come in and say, I want to be challenged, I want to take the hardest classes, but I recommend playing it smart, picking the classes that'll give you a high GPA, and then start applying for scholarships after that first semester. If you take your community college courses, those typically focus more on teaching and education, and four-year colleges typically focus more on research. So be aware of that. Universities like CU have special programs for people who have, who are living in poverty, who have very limited income. They can do a tuition waiver, they can add extra scholarships for you if you are living in poverty. That is something to let financial aid know about, and that is something that they can help you with. So we talked about how CU is $16,000, and there are lower cost universities. For example, Western Governors University, that costs, I think, 17500 per year, compared to CU's 16000 
And so that's the total cost as opposed to per semester. So you can find cheaper universities. There are options. So there are some tuition free universities. Those won't be the top universities, but they're incredibly successful for people with money challenges. If you have full time to devote to school, there's the University of People, UOP. And I believe that's $4,800 for an entire bachelor's degree. And then an additional $3,000 for a master's degree. Also, American University. American University is considered the gold standard to get a degree from. If you get a degree from AU, other countries will recognize that it is one of the top universities. Who is this? Does anybody recognize her? This is Simone Biles. You know, people, we are always excited because she's representing our country in the Olympics. And I was very excited that she worked hard to get her Olympics, obviously her medals as well, and she has a bachelor's from University of the People. She has a degree in business. So just so you know, it is doable. So you have options for money. Now, let's discuss if you don't want to go to college. That's fine. You have options too. So trade schools include things like plumbing, car repair, HVAC. Typically, those jobs pay very well. Not you know top of the field, but very well. And it requires less school, and those schools tend to be cheaper. Maybe it's a six-month to two-year training program. It wouldn't be considered college level. So you can see that those trades do make good money. Some up to $100,000 a year. That's not a bad option if you don't feel like college fits you. So I went to a venture capital firm where I attempted to start a business and they gave me Three hundred thirty thousand dollars for a significant amount of training, and Boulder has programs like TechStars and other VCs where you can apply, and they will give you education support for entrepreneurship. It is competitive, just so you know, but it is an option. This would have helped me a lot. When I went into school, I got terrible grades, I left and went into the real world and came back to college and got much better grades. And sometimes there is educational delay that includes language deprivation and everything of that nature. And sometimes if you come back to college, you are more mature than the other students, and that can benefit you. If you take a year or two year break to grow, that can really help you. Software development is a high demand career. I know that some software developers don't have a degree. All of they have is a high school diploma. And they went to freecodecamp.org. That is a free program. It is a lot of work. It is 300 hours to get your certificate and you're on your own. There are other coding camps that you have to pay for. However, there is more support and there's more investment in you. That's something you can Google and find. There's also CompTIA certification. That's a basic level certification for tech support and helping people fix their computers. RIT has a program for that over the summer where you go for 10 weeks to Rochester and they will pay your tuition, food, dorms, flights. They will completely pay for you to come. There are limited spots available, so it is a bit competitive. But that's really a fast track to a job.
So this does not replace a college degree, but many elite universities, for example, Wharton University, has certificates that you can pay maybe $600 for to take three online courses, and then you can say, I have a business certificate from Wharton. And that is a high-named school, and that has an impact on whether people want to hire you. So now we're going to move on to, you've decided to go to college, and now you've got to decide which college you want to go to. You can consider schools that focus on the needs of deaf people. There are deaf people with cochlear implants, deaf people who use cute speech, and there are colleges that cater to all of those students. We have Gallaudet, Rochester Institute of Technology, RIT, and California State University, Northridge, CSUN. RIT and Gallaudet have high national rankings. CU Boulder is number 99 in the country, which is a very good school. RIT is number 111, and Gallaudet is 128. CSU is 149. So on paper, these schools have very good reputations. Maybe if you're not interested in one of these schools, you could also focus on schools that have deaf-specific majors or deaf-specific departments. Maybe you, they have majors in ASL, majors in cued speech, I don't know if you can do that, but there are set up departments for deaf and hard of hearing people at those schools, for example. Schools like this, they do have good reputations, and you feel like you're a part of the campus community. Also, deaf people are more considered normal, so to speak, at these schools. I have a list of these that I'm giving out on the slides, so you can read some of these options later on as well. Now, when you go into college, my advice is to screen the schools, screen their disability services departments, their departments for your major, and the professors. All four of those will significantly impact your college career and your ability to graduate. If they have professors that are incredibly well respected, but their graduates don't earn a lot of money, and you can find those numbers online, Sometimes disability services will say, oh, we provide all of these services, we provide all these things, yes, we are ready, and then they actually don't. They'll do it later. It doesn't, it costs too much money, we can't do it. There have been lawsuits in the past related to universities failing to provide accommodations. So you can see if other people in your position have had support or have struggled to get those services. Sometimes the departments focus on teaching, and sometimes the departments focus on research. And they're saying, oh, okay, um, I'm going to teach a couple classes, but I'm here to research. And faculty has an incredibly important impact. If the teachers are not motivated on to teach to students' needs, that's a significant problem. Sometimes if someone is very focused on research, they have a PhD, but they're not a very nice person or a very effective teacher, that's not going to work. So you need to find teachers who are committed to their classes and committed to bringing students into the program. And hearing people do have an easier time doing this, we face a couple more roadblocks. So we picked a college. Now we need to talk about getting in. There's I'm going to keep this short, but there's three admission strategies. Universities typically have, they have, they already know how many students they're going to bring in for a freshman year. And then a second round and a third round of admissions. So if you have okay grades, okay test scores, apply early. Typically, you will also get more money from the university if you apply early. 
Most of us deaf and hard of hearing people have accessibility challenges that will impact our grades. So if you have bad grades from the class before you enter school, you have options. Don't worry. But you do require good grades from here on out. For example, here at CU, they do have a continuing education department. It's ce.colorado. Write that down, that's important. So if you are a non-traditional student, you just want to take a class about art history, you just want to take a class about chemistry, you can go in, pay to take one class, get a good grade, maybe become friends with two or three professors, cultivate those relationships, and then you'll have professors who can write great letters of rec for you and a record of good grades from that university and you can get in. It's a lot easier, especially if you have struggled with your grades in the past. CU has an agreement with several community colleges where they accept a certain number of transfer students every year. So FRCC, front range students, they are screened by GPA and they know that they will accept, for example, 100 transfer students. First, they accept all the 4.0s, 3.8s, and once they hit their 100 student quota, then they're done. I'm just making up that number. I don't know if it's 100. But if you enter community college with good grades, typically above a 3.0, you should be able to get into CU via a transfer program. I also have a short story to share with you. I had a PhD professor a long time ago. He was a friend of mine, and he struggled with English. It was not his first language, and he tried to get into the University of Connecticut. They didn't let him in because his English was so low, and they said, you can't succeed here. But he didn't give up. He really, he got ready, and he said, I'm going to take classes, get good grades, and prove myself. And they said, okay, one class. You can take one class. And he got an A. He worked so hard because he's a smart guy. And then they accepted him into the PhD program, and he graduated with a PhD. So you have options, even if you're concerned about your English skill as well. Some of us deaf people do struggle with English. So here's another strategy. I had a friend in an email who said, please excuse any errors. English is not my most fluent language. People looked at it and said, oh, OK. You're a foreign language student. Oh, English is your second language. And they were more accommodating to him. It was a huge contrast as compared to just writing an email without that caveat. So if you're ready for college, you're good to go. How do I turn around my GPA? How do I succeed in a hearing academic environment? The first step is to figure out what my challenges are and how to accomplish. There are challenges. We have language deprivation, educational issues where we don't have access to education, we might be behind educationally, that's not our fault. Sometimes there are theory of mind delays in DHH people, which means it's hard to enter social situations and interact with others, how to be political or diplomatic in particular situations, what's the best way to see another person's perspective when you're upset. For example, like, thank you for the lesson you just taught me by punching me in the face. That's pretty hard to say, right? So sometimes you have to catch up with theory of mind. Sometimes there's just not equal access to education for DHH people, even with accommodations. For example, research shows that people who have sign language interpreters typically score lower than people who are hearing in that same environment. Same with captionists. For example, I took a math class 
and the teacher would say, okay, we add this, and then we add this with that number over there, and then you see this here, and look at this, you three, you add these three things, and then, and the caption is just captioning, and they're just waiting for numbers. I mean, I love captionists, don't get me wrong, you're great, I love you, but you're waiting for the language, and you're catching up, catching up, and then I'm reading the captions, and it says, put this number here, and I look up, and he's not pointing at it anymore. My professor's now over on the other side of the room. You know, he's getting a glass of water. He's done. So all of that access is not provided to us. We do have a delay, and that's important to understand. So now, what strategies help us? You know, there are several, but I'm going to try to pick my particular favorite. First is about framing. How do you see the situation? How do you look at college? The frame that you need to realize is that you are in charge of your own education. You decide the quality of your education. For example, if I go into a restaurant, I order a burger, it costs $10, I bite into it, and it is horrible. And I, there's a fly in there. I open it up and there's a fly in there. What would you do? Ask for your money back. But say you go to college, you go in, you take a class, and it's horrible. And you pay $3,000 for that credit? What do you do? Oh, well. Think about the different reactions. You are the person who's in charge of your education. Not your university, not your mom, not your interpreter, not your dog. You. And sometimes that's not the case, but that's another story. You know Karens, right? I hate Karens, personally. They make my life harder. Much harder. But you can be a Karen. I would like you to be a Karen, please. What does that look like? So deaf people are sometimes a little bit afraid to pursue something because they don't want to upset the status quo even if their rights are being violated. What's important is to stand up for yourself. You know, if you're trying to be nice, you're trying to fit in with peer and culture, no, you say, you are eliminating my rights, that is not appropriate, and that is not okay. Ask for the manager, ask for the manager. Maybe not every single time, but you can be a Karen, and I'm giving you permission to do so. Now, let's talk about GPA. You are a top student. What do I mean by that? Typically, when you go into a university, you think, oh, I'm okay. But no, think, I am a top student, but accessibility concerns are not making things easier for me. I could have a great GPA, but because of my accessibility issues, I am not getting those grades. And you can say, this is not working for me, I need something else. Sometimes the accessibility departments say, oh, you have good enough grades, you're fine, you have a 3.0. But tell them that's not acceptable. Remember, you can tell them, I'm trying to go to grad school, I need at least a 3.0. A 2.5 is not good enough, I can't get into grad school with these grades, that is not acceptable. I am a top student and you are top students. Think to yourself, I deserve better than what I am getting. If you think your GPA is good enough, maybe you're at University of Alabama, for example, not Harvard, not Berkeley, but you want to go to law school, the average GPA is a 3.7 for that law school. And that's an average law school, it's not Harvard. So there's a lot of missed opportunities when your GPA is not top of the class. If they're saying, oh, your 2.5 is good enough, tell them it's not good enough. I need more support. So now we're done with framing, and we're going to talk about self-awareness. Sometimes with a delay in language, this is a little bit harder for us. So I don't want to spend all of my time on this, but I'm going to give a couple of tips. Hidden disabilities are real. 
they are a real pain when you're trying to do things as a deaf person. For example, if you have ADHD, autism, dyslexia, dyscalculia, generalized anxiety, many times deaf people are overlooked because, oh, you're deaf, that's the cause of all your issues. But sometimes you might have a hidden additional disability. And there are other ways of functioning if you recognize what's happening. Whereas before you had a 29% chance of graduating, and now it's down to 10% because of your hidden disability. So I have to figure out, do I have ADHD? Do I have another hidden disability? And what can I do? How do I get support for those disabilities? And your chance of graduating goes way up. This sounds like, oh, meditate, sit in the forest. You can do that if you'd like to. But this is serious. Sometimes there are social delays and educational delays. And what we have to do is sit down, spend time on self-analysis, maybe journaling or therapy, whatever works for you, and develop my relationship with people. Think about, why did I act this way? What am I doing? Where is my life going? And you can be more socially aware, more tactful, more skilled at navigating the system once you do this. This is a very valuable practice. Now we'll talk a little bit more about accommodation. I'm trying to speed through some slides, and there is more information on those in the email I will send out. So I'm going to summarize some of the key points in this next part so I don't put you to sleep by accident. The first strategy I recommend is note takers. The school will provide note takers. Take that opportunity because it's really difficult to write your own notes and be a DHH person in the classroom. However, sometimes if you don't take your own notes, you don't learn as much. I threw away mine and started reading somebody else's notes. I didn't learn as much. So. Another reason why it might benefit you to take your own notes as well, take a look here. When I started comparing my notes to the note taker's notes, I realized there were huge differences in the information that I was missing. Use this technique to find out if your accommodations are successful or not. Sometimes the disability office says, oh, you're fine, you can take your own notes, and you can compare and say, this is how much I'm missing when I try to do this. You can also create new approaches. Don't be afraid to say, none of the current accommodations are working for me, let's try something new. Propose a new idea, maybe it's AI, maybe it's some new tech, you can do that. Now, how did I get good grades? How did I get between that 3.8 and 4.0? How do I get that elusive 3.8 to 4.0? Let's talk about it. There's a reason behind doing all these things. Sometimes there's a stereotype that deaf people are, you know, they're good enough, they won't participate in class, and we're forgotten about. They think, we didn't work hard, we didn't participate. So it's important to ask questions in class and tell the teacher, I'm here, I'm working hard. And that also helps you learn better when you ask questions. This is also good advice for hearing people, but for deaf people, this has an enormous benefit to this approach. If you're feeling a little bit timid about raising your hand in class, that's okay. You don't have to ask questions after every sentence. I was the person who did that when I was in college, but if you are more timid about it, ask questions every so often just to prove your engagement. It's also important because academic lag can be remedied 
through office hours and not necessarily having the best accessibility in class means office hours are vital to you. You can ask, what am I doing wrong? Ask for advice, ask for help with group projects. You can ask, hey, how's your family doing? Because you can definitely get letters of rec from people, and if they have name, comma, PhD, that carries significant weight. And in the letter they might say, this student came to my office every day and nobody else did. That looks great for future opportunities and future jobs. Drum roll, please. I want you to look at this for a minute. Take a look here. We've got the five and 10% and the 90%. This talks about when you learn something, how much do you retain of what you just did? If you're just sitting and passively watching a lecture, you'll retain 5% of it. If you're talking to your friend and you say, I remember this much of the speech, it's probably around 5%. Reading gets you about 10% retention. Most college students, hearing and deaf people, will learn through lecture and through reading, and that's it. But for us, when we teach other people what we just learned, that sticks. That helps you remember everything. And when you're explaining it to somebody else, you realize what gaps you have, and that's really important. You can teach immediately after you learn. Now the second part of this strategy Take a look here. Sorry, I'm going to sort of connect this back um, because you can read it later in the handout if you'd like to. In English and in ASL, what you can do is you can stay in the class, learn, and then publish a paper or a blog and put that on your resume about what you learned in class that day. When you're applying for a job, competing against hearing people for more accessibility, you can say, oh yeah, I have 10 published items, take a look here. It really looks good and benefits you. Maybe if you don't feel comfortable with English, that's totally fine, you have options. If you don't feel comfortable in ASL, you can do it a different way as well. You can sign your opinions. You can make a video or a series. Maybe sell it later on. Maybe make a YouTube channel where you can list everything you're learning. You can do it in English or in sign, but if you'd rather neither of those languages, then maybe if your sign language is understandable enough, you'll be good to go. People aren't there to criticize your signing skills. For example, here at CU, they have competitive grading, which means that 10% of students will get an A. 15% will get a B. You are competing with people who have more access than you, and that might hurt your learning. You know, you know the material, but because everyone else has more access than you, you end up being the D student. In those community college where they really focus on teaching, you can take classes like calculus, biology, physics, A and P, you have many options. I'm going to keep this short and talk a little bit more about faculty. Some faculty become the most important part of your college career. So pick faculty who are empathic. And you have to understand the difference between real empathy and fake empathy. There is a big difference, and that will help you in life. 
deaf people typically are more intuitive about body language and facial expressions. And that can become our superpower because we can easily identify which professors are the most empathetic. You can see this in the notes and read it a little bit more, but there are also professor evaluations, and you can see what other people think of those professors as well. We talked about showing up to office hours. You can also email them after you finish the class. Every once in a while, say, hi, I learned so much in your class. Remember the day you taught us about cookies? or whatever, just email later on to keep yourself at their front of their mind. Now we have three more slides talking about self-advocacy. Self-advocacy means standing up for yourself as a deaf person. And this will be a skill for your whole life, so it's good to start in college. How many of us have read the Americans with Disabilities Act? Oh, two of us. Yay. Oh, three, four. OK, we have some people. If you read it, you know exactly what it is. What does the ADA say about reasonable accommodation? It says that I have the right to change an accommodation if it's not working for me. Also, read your school's undergraduate accessibility policies. For example, if you're taking a test, and maybe you're scratching your head and the professor says, cheater, cheater, you're signing, you're signing, what do you do? You know if you've read the academic policies how to fight back against that accusation. This is a big discussion right now that's a little bit difficult to summarize. But your school has options, including ombuds and other ways to escalate issues that are occurring. For example, you can bring it to the department chair, the dean. There are people who can help you sit down and mediate an issue. Be a parent. It's OK. Say, I want to talk to the manager. You can do that. It's OK. Don't say it too often, but do it. There are also options outside of school. The first and most important one, the Department of Education has the Office of Civil Rights. If your school does not provide an interpreter, a captionist, a cute speech transliterator, if they are not giving you what you deserve, you can complain and someone can come investigate. This is a serious legal issue if you are not receiving the accommodations that were promised to you. A lot of schools don't want to deal with a investigation, but if need be, there are successful legal options. My friend, she went to Southeastern Louisiana University. She got her master's in education. So she finished up all her courses. She was ready to get her diploma. And it said, we're not giving your diploma to you. You're deaf, you shouldn't be teaching. This was in the 1980s. My friend, she can be a Karen. She can be. She's my favorite kind of Karen. She said, oh, 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 oh no. This is not the situation. And she won the case, got her master's. And because of that, many schools are now afraid to decline people their diplomas because of my friend's legal action. I really appreciate you all sitting with me here today, and I would love to discuss more ideas. I have so many strategies and experiences that I would love to share that I was not able to put in the slides, but if you read the PowerPoint notes that I will hand out an email, there's a lot more explanation on each slide. Don't worry if you missed anything today, and thank you. You got this. You are top students. You are in charge, all of you. Thank you. Thank you.